goodness. Hi, everyone. How are you? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Jeanette McCune. I have the great privilege of serving as our Director of School and Community Programs here in the Education Division at the Kennedy Center. And I'm so honored today to be here for our ses session, Signal Boost, Equity and Access in Music and Wellness. This is an incredible assemblage of leaders, an incredible assemblage of, of, of thought leaders in particular. And so I just want to, out of respect for my colleagues, give them each a moment to share a little bit about who they are and the work that they do. So. I'll start with you, my colleague. Hi, everyone. It's such an honor to be here. My name is Stacy Amon Yaldell, and I'm a board-certified music psychotherapist. I'm also a vocal psychotherapist, and I'm the founder of a Mantra, which is a wellness consulting company, and I'm based in Los Angeles. Hi, everyone. My name is Maria Gracia Rivas Berrier. Some people know me as MG. I am a board-certified music therapist currently working in the Center for Cancer and Blood Disorders at Children's National. I'm one of the... I'm the current president for the Latin Music Therapy Network and one of the newly co-founders co for the American, for I'm sorry, the Peruvian Music Therapy Association. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is working? Yeah. I'm Rebecca Menza, I'm a nurse practitioner at San Francisco General Hospital in the Trauma Surgical Intensive Care Unit. Um, I am also a recent graduate of UCSF where I just obtained a PhD examining the use of self-selected music for symptom management and critical care, and under the mentorship of Julian Johnson, and uh, among others. And I am the recent past of the first uh, leader of the student uh, affinity group for Sound Health Network. Super honored to be here. Big, big deal privilege. Hi, everyone. There we go. Yes, it works. <laughs> I'm Marisol Norris. I'm the director of music therapy at Drexel University and also the founder of the Black Music Therapy Network. I'm also very excited to be here with everyone here. Hi, everyone. My name is Carlita Victoria. I am an artist, a performer, a singer, a dancer. And in addition to that, I am the executive director and founder of Darkness Rising Project, which is a black mental health nonprofit which provides free resources to the black community. Uh, we find a therapist for black people, and we also provide free therapy for community members who have been formerly incarcerated. Hi, I'm Quetzal Flores. I am a musician, a uh, cultural organizer. I am the program manager for the Alliance of, uh, for California Traditional Arts, and I am the co-founder and the director of membership and wellness for the Community Power Collective. Excellent, thank you all so much. So my job is to make sure that these brilliant minds are able to share some deep thoughts and important thoughts about Im adverse impacts for mental health, especially for our marginalized and, and BIPOC communities. But I felt like we should probably start with the grounding. So colleagues, jump in where you, where you will and I'll prompt a question. But let's start with providing a grounding for our audience about the adverse mental health impacts that are occurring in our community and the current state of interventions through those therapeutic modalities. So would anyone like to take that particular particular thing about kind of where we where we are nationally right now in this in this field and how the impacts are. I'll jump in here. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> as as a community member who is not a therapist but who has been in therapy for many years and who I've been to art therapy and I've also had music therapy and I'm very grateful for all of the leaders here. Um, what I would say is that the pandemic has impacted marginalized communities in ways that we never expected. Um, I can speak on behalf of artists as well and artists of color. Um, a lot of us uh, were without jobs. Uh, a lot of us did not have um, insurance and therefore could not see a doctor, which impacts your mental health. Uh, we could not, those of us who were in therapy, um, many of us had to stop going to therapy because we did not have uh, funding to go to therapy and or we were not aware of some of the programs um, that were created to be able to continue therapy during that time. Um, for a lot of us, we also watched as our community members uh, were killed and brutalized by the police during the pandemic. And during that time, we also saw a big demand for change. And then when we came back to the world, we expected to see that change. And I think that a lot of us have been very disappointed um, and not seeing the change that we expected to see. And regarding Darkness Rising and the number 
of, of reach outs that we've gotten that has grown significantly during the pandemic. It has, it, it has, we have had to reach out to therapist upon therapist. Do you have any space? Can you see anyone? Um, I'm sure you all have been, have, have been backed up <laughs> and have very long waiting list. Uh, people are absolutely in need and the, the pandemic um, really shook us to the core. Did anybody else have anything to offer to that? Yeah, I, I would like to add a little bit to that. This, thank you for articulating that so, so brilliantly. Um, so basically, we're in crisis. We were already in crisis, and we're in a worse crisis now. Um, in my work, we work uh, with, with uh, in housing justice and economic justice. And in particular, on the economic justice side, we work with street vendors. And in Los Angeles, street vending until very recently was, uh, was illegal, right? The last major city in the United States to, to legalize street vending. And even after it was legalized, was still criminalized. Until very recently, a state law was passed to decriminalize street vending. We also see tons of people who were already feeling the pressure of gentrification, displacement, in these communities that have been brought to their knees systematically and now are being preyed upon through speculative investment, and so on and so forth. And so we're seeing the impacts of all of this times a million through the pandemic and watching politicians, watching uh, people in power refuse to protect people, like literally refuse to protect them through uh, tenant protections through uh, eviction protections, et cetera, through uh, right, right to work for people who are taking the situation into their own hands and creating their own, their own sustainability, refusing to give them the right to work. And so um, this, is, this is what we're experiencing. Uh, this is not unique to, to the neighborhoods that I work in. This is what we're experiencing uh, worldwide. Thank you. Um, Marisol, I wonder if I can actually call on you because um, music therapy, I, I'm also a parent and I'm, I'm gonna share my own personal experience. I have a child who's a teenager who um, has autism and ADHD and music therapy has been life-changing. It, it has been remarkable and under the hands and guidance of a really effective um, music therapist, it, it really can be a truly just, again, a voice for someone who hasn't had one. And Marisol, the work that you did this morning, I wondered if you would be willing to share, or not all of our colleagues had an opportunity to experience that, but just talk a little bit about that structure and process um, as it related to the music therapeutic modality and kind of some of the challenges that exist with some of the ideas that people have what music therapy is. We'd, it was really a remarkable experience. Just be helpful. Yeah, here. so I, I had uh, the deep privilege of working with Howard University students, all which are in the audience <laughs> in this first row and scattered throughout as well. And I think that um, it's really important to, to note that some of the things that happened in that space, the active improvisation that took place in that space, are um, in alignment with some of the theories that exist within music therapy, but there are also ways in which what took place transgressed what we define music therapy to be. And so I think the question of defining music therapy is often um, something that is very political, right? Who is at the table? Who um, is able to um, contribute to theories? Whose theories we've learned as are the basis and the foundation of work? And oftentimes what I find, and this is kind of to tie into the question that we had earlier, is that oftentimes there are ways in which um, students graduating from traditional music therapy programs have to do a process of learning and then unlearning when they return back to marginalized communities. And what do I mean by that? Um, because a lot of the different theories and practices, as with all disciplines, so this is not unique to music therapy, but it has foundations within um, dominant culture, dominant linguistic practices, dominant um, healthcare structures, uh, the ways in which we then have to re-establish new ways of being within certain contexts. Gets, it's a decentralization of the learning that we often have in our education. And so to kind of um, connect to what was already said, 
the pandemic amplified the injustices and the inequities within our, our work. It's, I think that it, it, it showed us new things, but the system was already broken, right, for those that were at the margins. And so um, in many ways, music and the defining of music, it, it highlights this piece around moving towards optimal health and whatever that may be, but I always like to situate it within context. Who is defining what are the meaning-making experiences that the clients are having in that moment and then leading from that place? Wow, that's incredibly powerful. Do you have something to Can add? Can I add something Please. to that? Um, I don't practice music therapy. I'm a nurse. I'm a nurse practitioner. So I use music as a therapeutic intervention. Music listening in the intensive care unit is something you can actively do while you're lying on a ventilator in the ICU. And, of course, the pandemic raised everybody's attention for what it means to be hospitalized, what it means to be hospitalized in an intensive care unit. And then we did this really inhumane, disgusting thing, which is that we stripped people of all of their people. We said, you can't visit, you can't be together. And we took an extremely lonely, um, extremely separate, terrifying experience of being hospitalized, and we made it worse. And I, and I think that um, we, we do a lot in the name of evidence, and I'm still not sure that that was evidence-informed, and I don't think it was safe. Um, so, and that was one of the great sort of moral injuries that uh, a lot of my colleagues and I suffered, is to watch people be separated from their families and friends, their folks. I think similarly, the, um, and the as a, as a PhD student and as somebody who is exploring the use of therapeutic music interventions and music listening interventions, I, I did this thing, which is that I looked to the literature to see what, can, what has been done and then how can I add to that or you know, extend it. And what I found for use of music in hospital settings was that it was like everything in hospital settings. It was set up for one person, one kind of person, and um, it was Mozart, you know, it's Mozart for relaxation. It's Mozart for pain or anxiety. It's relaxing, slow tempo music. And that might be your thing, you know, it might be your thing, but maybe your thing isn't relaxing. Maybe your thing is fighting for your life. Maybe your thing is connecting to your identity, connecting to your resilience, your hope. Uh, passing some time, thinking about people you've lost, finding strength. Maybe what you need is not to relax. You know, maybe relaxation is, a, is, a, is something that we assign people that we want them to be relaxed. We want people to be calm. We don't want people to engage in a way that feels safe or productive or soothing to them. We decide, like everything else in hospitals. So it's this infrastructure that is set up, and just like blood pressure control and medications for blood pressure, like everything else, I found that some of the available evidence to build upon that music medicine was flawed in the same ways, was vulnerable in the same ways, and that until we ask folks, what is it that you are using music for? So I asked people, I asked, a, a wide variety of people. Why, why did you listen to music? What did you listen to it for? No one said pain. No one said anxiety. No one said to relax. Well, one guy a little bit. Relax my mind, right? A little bit. But really it was to connect, just like we heard last night, just like we heard this morning. It was to connect, to be seen. And when asking and also saying, what do you want to listen to? Five different languages of music we played. We played Jesus, Adrian Romero. We played, we played Santana. We played um, some jazz standards for some people. Cantonese worship music for others. I mean, it was just all over the place. Bob Marley. People said they felt seen and vouched for and like they had a place in this hospital which has not been built for them and yet was overflowing with people who don't have good access to care, who are being stricken by a pandemic in disproportionate numbers. So I just, I, I felt like, and that's how I ended up here, we had these conversations in the Sound Health Student Affinity Group about, we called it decolonizing the music health space, the intersection of music and literature space and the science. 
So I just, and I just wanna add that I'm extremely nervous today. <laughs> and I'm nervous because I'm in a group of people who are so, you know, you know all of this, you know. And I think you wrote back on, on the little Google thread we had going about how, you know, everyone knows you're supposed to be able to pick your own music, right? So you know all this, and also I, I received the stories of intensely sick, injured people who'd been through more trauma prior to the hospitalization, and then during the hospitalization than I've ever experienced. And I feel that, like this, this immense responsibility to convey their experiences, their needs as best I can. And so I just wanna just pu put that out there that you know I'm honoring them now. Yeah, may I say just something? I think it's important to also um, touch on the fact that as music therapy students, we often think of relaxation as our goal, but just like you said, sometimes relaxation is something that happens after a cathartic moment. Sometimes relaxation is something that happens when you really um, are able to focus on your trauma and go through that discomfort with a trusted therapeutic clinician um, with the, within that therapeutic rapport. And so while relaxation might not be the goal, it can often be the result. And I saw all those same things that you talked about. Um, I work in a pediatric hospital, but I saw the same effect on not just children, but caregivers and family members. Only one caregiver could be at bedside. And when you are there for a pain crisis or an, onco uh, an oncology diagnosis to only have one caregiver at bedside is not gonna be good for anyone in the family. Um, and I think it's also important, and this might lead us into the next question, is when you don't see yourself represented in your therapist, and we notice a lot of this in the lack of diversity in multiple fields, not just music therapy fields, then that trauma that you may experience in a hospital um, can be exacerbated even more because then you don't have when you don't see someone that looks like you, you oftentimes think that this is not for you. But we can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and talk about yeah. that. Can I, can I? <laughs> Would you like to go ahead? Yeah. And I just wanted to comment on what both of you all said. First of all, thank you for sharing that because you don't have to be a music therapist to behold and experience the power of music and how it can transform. So thank you for sharing your experiences. And you know, interestingly enough, the music therapy field has a term called the ISO principle that speaks directly to what you're saying, and it's meeting people where they are. And I think that's the key is, you know, I can meet you where you are. I'm not walking into the room p playing Pharrell happy because, you know, I want you to be happy. And by the way, don't try that because you might get a shoe thrown at you. I think I wrote about that before, but um, so validation is the word that comes to mind, and that's what music does at its best, is it validates emotions, you know? And I think when we talk about music therapy definitions, um, what I like to think about is music therapy is the cure to separation sickness. When we look at the pandemic, we look at the increase of addiction and you know how people are uh, more and more lonely being a pandemic itself. Um, music is a heart-centering experience. It's mindful, it cultivates presence, and best of all, it takes you out of your head. And that's where most of the tyranny is happening. Well, I'll speak for myself. Most of the tyranny for me is happening in my surface mind. So music has that ability to take us right out of that insanity and bypass the ego, bypass all of the defense mechanisms that are in place by the ego to prevent real change from happening. And I think that's really, you know, why it's important to change these definitions we have, so to speak, of what it is, because at its core, you know, it's a very natural process of getting out of one's way and allowing allowing presence to, uh, to emerge in that space. So I just wanted to share that. I, w I wanted to talk more about this idea of connection and the idea that uh, we really need to see someone who looks like us, someone who, that we can identify with uh, when we're receiving care. It's something that when I was younger, I didn't even realize. And my, ther my first therapist, um, I didn't realize it then. It took me, I would say, six months into therapy um, realizing I'm explaining the nuances of my culture over and over and over again. How can I avoid that? How can, how can I um, speak to someone who just 
gets it so that we can get to the other part of therapy, so we can get to the, you know, the other side of that. Um, and when I did finally uh, start seeing a black woman therapist, y'all, <laughs> things just changed in ways that I could not describe. I could talk about my hair. I can talk about you know things that are just that exist within my culture, and I don't have to explain myself. And and that feeling right there, that's a feeling of safety. And when you feel safe when you're receiving care, that elevates that care to another level. So you know the work that we do at Darkness Rising Project, as far as connecting people to therapists that look like them that work is so important because, and that's the reason why we always send a photo of the therapist, because I feel like receiving that picture, that's the first step to knowing, oh, I'm, I'm gonna feel safe with this person, and then speaking to them, and then having that conversation, that's another step. And all of that is just grounding you in, in more and more safety. And I think a lot of us, including myself, I didn't know that there was a black woman therapist out there for me. Everyone that I see on TV and in movies, and I, I'm just, I was like, oh, there's probably not a therapist that looks like me, someone who understands me. And I did not even try to find someone who looks like me. Um, and, and so our goal is, is making sure that people are aware that, that therapists who look like you, they exist. They're out there for you. And Darkness Rising Project and a lot of other resources, um, like the, Bor the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation and several other resources, they're out there waiting to connect you to a therapist who looks like you and understands exactly um, and, and, can, and can help you as in your wellness journey. Outstanding. Katzel, did you have something Yeah, to I'd add? like to add a little bit to that. I, I was thinking about something else, but you just took me somewhere else with this, so I'll just respond to what you just said, and that is that, uh, so I work, I, I developed a robust prison program with the Alliance for California Traditional Arts. One of our teachers is here today. Juan, raise your hand. <laughs> he's he's going to be in the collective songwriting workshop downstairs after this. But, so Juan, myself, and a bunch of other musicians teach inside prison, and, and that was the idea, was that um, if we can bring artists that come from communities and like the folks that are in prison, who are mostly black and brown people, and introduce them to uh, these cultural, these convening methodologies, like hip hop at its core, the cypher, the circle, that, that original concept of hip hop, like fandango, which is in, in uh, music from Veracruz, and the communal practice of that, and so on and so forth. If we can introduce folks to that, those sort of circle building spaces by people from communities or like communities, that we can create pathways for mobility and of healing, right? And we've seen this. I, I taught a class um, at a prison called California City, and um, these were all folks that were gonna get out within a couple of years, right? And one guy was gonna get out very quickly, and he was an older black man, and he, he after one of the classes, we actually read uh, Will to Change, Bell Hooks, Will to Change. And, um, you know, we had these incredible conversations about, about what masculinity really means, what it means to be a man, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and then to de deconstruct white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, which is another way of talking about what we're talking about, right? In, in really dismantling these systems and building the thing that will have the impact that we actually intend to have as human beings, right? And so, um, one guy comes up to me and he's like, you know, listen, he's like, I want to talk to you real quick because, you know, what we, what we read, it's really impacting me. And he says, I'm about to get out and my daughter just came out to me and I want to know how to support her, right? And I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, I have a queer son, but I'm not queer. I said, uh, and I would say these questions, you can ask, you can ask them these questions and see how they respond, you know? And he was very concerned because being queer in the black community is, is a thing, you know? As in any community, because of the society we live in. And, and it was incredibly powerful that he could be vulnerable, that he could open up in this way, and that we had this connection, there was that trust. And this is all the things that we're talking about, they repeat themselves in different spaces over and over. Yes, absolutely, in, in music therapy spaces, and also, in all these other spaces, and we need to proliferate these types of critical connections. 
Well, and I think what, we, what we're really getting to is this idea that context and identity matters. Um, and when, when you're choosing, and you have to choose to go into, into therapy as, as, a, as a human being, you, you're making a choice that sometimes it may be a hard one because, as you said, you, you didn't see anybody that looked like you. You wondered if you are struggling to find someone who looks like you and who may be someone that can address and understand where you're coming from, it's going to be harder to even walk into that space. If you look at media, you look at a lot of other spaces, it seems that therapy isn't necessarily for those of us within those our marginalized communities. And I do wonder if, um, for our practitioners, if you might talk a little bit about your pathway of becoming a professional, some of the pitfalls, as well as some of the things that helped you in your journey, if you'd be willing to share. Yeah, I, what just came to mind was when I was writing my thesis all those years ago um, about uh, working with hip hop and you know black men in the psych unit. And I read a book called uh, "Lay My Burden Down" by Alvin Poussaint. And one of the things he said was that there is a long-standing distrust among the black community of the medical field due to experimentation, due to the syphilis experiments, and due to transgenerational. Um, uh, transgenerational and trans post-traumatic slave syndrome is what he talked about in the book. So I think to have this conversation, we must acknowledge this kind of undercurrent um, that may not be there on a conscious level, uh, but may still be there on an unconscious level, this kind of distrust. And then there's also the religious part of that, our beautiful black church, you know, that's so rich in history, um, that at times also says, you don't need therapy, you need Jesus, you know, those kinds of things. And again, God bless the church. I love the church. And I also realize that as a practitioner for myself personally that I need both, right? And I think that spirit would guide me to get mental help if I needed mental health. So there are all these messages that are kind of in the mix um, that, again, may not be on a conscious level, but that are, are, are definitely there. So that was the first thing that came up because then that leads to how maybe it would feel safe for a, a person of color to then go get a therapist who's a person of color. There's a little context there, right? It's not just about representation, but it's also about, okay, now I feel safer because I'm working with all this unconscious material that's that's going to get, that's hopefully going to come up within the therapeutic space, but it's a part of my trauma. It's a part of what that is. And I think that kind of dovetails with my personal journey because I didn't set out to be a therapist. I mean, my story is that I was a recording artist at 16 years old and I got thrown into the music business and um, I had no sense of self outside of that. Um, I saw only that occurring. I didn't see any other outcome. And when that didn't happen, it spiraled me into um, my own mental health issues in my early 20s. And I'd heard about music therapy and it sounded like something I needed. <laughs> and I still remember the day that I was in um, the, uh, a class with an, actually an acoustics class, which is a, uh, audio engineering. And I asked my acoustic teacher, why does music make me feel the way that I do? That's what I wanna know. I was, I'm heartbroken. I had 10 years in the music business and I'm only 26. So why does music make me feel the way that I do? And he said, you'll have to ask a music therapist. <laughs> this is an acoustics class. But what I was really asking was vibrationally, yeah. why? Yeah. I wanted to know why. And when I was in that concert last night, I had a moment where I remembered. I was like, this, this is that feeling I've been chasing after since I, was, since I even heard what music therapy is. You know, so my path was unconventional because I was the one who needed the healing. I had severe creative injury due to the music industry, severe. And that's a, 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 a term that Julia Cameron coined, creative injury, and she wrote The Artist's Way. And so that journey to heal myself is what led me into the healing field. And so I'm what they call the archetypal wounded healer, you know, from the place of being wounded myself, seeking that healing. And that's a cyclical, continuous spiral. I don't get healed and then get on the soapbox and heal you, right? It is a continual, it is a parallel process that is always unfolding and taking place. And I know for a fact that I can't lead anyone anywhere where I have not been myself, or at least where I'm willing to go. And that's why every therapist should have a therapist. And I'm gonna get off my soapbox now. Yes. Anyone else have anything to yeah. add? Yeah, I think uh, the biggest thing that came for me when you asked that question was finding my professional identity was very much embedded with my personal identity. Uh, for a little background, I'm an immigrant from Peru, and I moved to the United States when I was 11, spoke no English, and 
in a desperate attempt to assimilate to this country, I very much now can say that I abandoned my culture. And it wasn't until I was studying music therapy um, and I was interning where I now work um, that I started having these Latin um, patients. I was being assigned these Latin. And I remember there was part of me that got very defensive and I can admit that now, uh, when my supervisor, my internship supervisor was giving me almost all of the um, Latin or Spanish speaking clients, I remember thinking, well, where, why am I getting, you know, everyone that speaks Spanish when I know most songs in English? This is not fair. Am I being, um, you know, I felt like I was being targeted, but it wasn't until years later when I did a lot of inner work that I recognized that I had not really um, gone back to my roots. And it, have, it was very important for me to do, as you said, a lot of inner healing in who I was as a person so that I could be a better therapist. And now I can better connect with my clients. And the simple matter is, is even language aside, what we were talking about, that representation matters. And now when I, when I have Latin or Spanish speaking or even... Um, patients that are from different countries, even me stepping into the room and them seeing my name, Maria Gracia, we have a lot of patients from the UAE. They see my name and they're like, oh, you're not, you're not from here, right? Um, and uh, there's almost a, a quicker bond because we can recognize that neither of us were born or raised here. And so I think the biggest thing for me is that studying music therapy almost put me in front of the mirror and allowed me to see things that I had abandoned due to a desperation to assimilate and it was very difficult but very much needed and I'm forever grateful for it because now um, I have connected with multiple Latin music therapists and other clinicians as well and I can continue to do that inner work so that I can, of course, um, serve not only my community but try to help other music therapy students and seeing the necessity in that as well. I just want to add to this, I'm, and I'm so very thankful that we've talked about the wounded healer, and we've also talked about representation in the ways that we have, and then also Maricia Gracia to be able to speak to, you know, while representation is important, there, you know, it's it's part of um, a, a way of addressing some of the systems, but it's not the, it, it doesn't end there, because you have to have therapists that are conscious therapists, too, that have critical ways of being with people um, that can ensure that there's an effectiveness within within the therapeutic process. And so I think that um, uh, thinking about the person of the therapist, which is um, linked to this idea of the wounded healer, but um, a couples and family therapy model that's been recently adopted in music therapy from um, Harry Aponte is something that really um, uh, uh, resonates with me in the work that I do. I think one of the things that has been probably the most profound um, and meaningful moments for me in my identity as a therapist has actually been to recognize that music therapist is not my only identity. <laughs> and I think that's significant. And I, and I say that in, um, because uh, there's many ways in which we um, take our professional identities and elevate them in, in, and pedestal them in different ways that um, disconnects us from the histories, the legacies, the cultures that we are we're born into. And so there's a way in which um, I think for the past few years, I've, I've, I've gone, and, and this is actually something I think is sometimes um, tricky to say in, 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 in mixed spaces, but sometimes I, like every year I have a moment where I say I don't wanna be a music therapist. Like every single year I have a, a existential crisis. It lasts for about two to three weeks and then it arises at different points where I think, you know, is music therapy the space for me? And I think there was one time I met, um, I spoke with an elder, a music therapist, um, educator out of uh, I think Wisconsin. And she said to me, I, and I, I had this existential crisis that happened to be at a music therapy conference. <laughs> And, and I said, you know, how is it that you have been able to navigate so many different spaces? And she was an a organist, she was a musician, she kind of came to the field of music therapy, left the field of music therapy in professional ways, and then reemerged re as a director, as a teacher in different spaces. And she says, well, music therapy is not my core identity. 
And I think that's important, not just for the practitioner, but it's important to decentralize professions in the lives of the communities that we serve. And because oftentimes we get stuck on the proving of a thing or the standardization of a thing, and then we don't recognize the humanity and the relationship, right? And so that goes back to this question of evidence, right? Because evidence oftentimes, again, is the, the reason why evidence hasn't been working uh, for marginalized communities is because evidence is often standardized to the dominant culture, right? Again. And so um, I, I can speak of multiple researchers, many wonderful researchers in this room that have been doing phenomenal work around the different aspects of music therapy, what the effective mechanisms in the work. But I think the, the, the challenge is that, that the, the, there's many challenges. <laughs> can't tell you is one. I think people are doing effective work, but there's also a, a count, challenges that we're seeing across the board in that that evidence doesn't match the, the experiences of those that are in the margins. And so what does it mean to take the margins into the center um, within the research practices uh, that, we, that we use to support the people we serve, right? And so I think there's, there's again, I'm going back to defining because I think it's, it's, it's critically important. Because defining is how we oper operationalize, excuse me, it's been a long day, operationalize terms, right? Defining is how we think about the construct of music, health, wellness, and it's the ways in which we re recreate our research questions. Right? And so when those that are in the, in, in the, in the spaces to create those definitions and also ask the questions um, regarding communities that are oftentimes seen as deficited, right? The questions that we ask aren't necessarily the right questions. And so there's, there's a piece of being able to ensure that that there are not single voices to the table when it comes to research, there are multiple voices at that table, and at the center of that work that the client gets to define what it is that we see. I'm very interested in what um, marginalized communities think music therapy is. And, and I think that that's the research that needs to be done. Um, I plan on doing it if you wanna do something too, that's fine. <laughs> but, it, but I would like to know when you step into a, when a client steps into the room and they see music therapy or, or have a music facilitated um, experience, what do they, how do they define it? That is gonna be critically important to understanding how change takes place in a space. And as much as we define, um, unless that happens, we're gonna fall short of something. And if I can just say one more thing, thinking about um, some of the practices, there, I think therapy is vitally important in because it, it, it's a catalyst of change, right? It's a therapeutic process um, coming from my own music therapist background that includes uh, that, that, that uh, music therapy triad that we, we hear so much about, the therapist, the music, the client, the relationship. And for me, I think it's within concentric circles, the healthcare systems, the societies. And when we think about um, um, even this idea of when we listen to a song, we're bringing in this unconscious, but we're bringing in the communal, we're bringing in the collective because we have associations, we have political contexts that are all arriving in the music and oftentimes we think when the music comes, it disappears. That stuff does not disappear. It actually sometimes activates and re-energizes the space. And then when we think about resistance or, or rage or any of those things, those things don't necessarily dissipate just because music is present. The question is, what are our clients sharing with us and what are they not? And I think a lot of times in minoritized communities, that, and there's research that does back this, the ways in which clients have to adjust and readjust within spaces that don't take the fullness of their humanity to account. And so there's a, sh a shifting and a reshifting that, that does take place. And that in itself is, is a, a stress coping strategy that we don't, we don't always account for. So I know that we, uh, there was a question in there. I just kind of no, rambles no, no, a little bit. You did not but ramble. I think Actually, you answered most of the questions that we had. <laughs> But, but it, 
it, but it, 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 it's important about how we construct research teams, how do we come up with the questions that we ask, what we find to be important, and the decentralizing of particular professions in understanding that question. It goes back to bell hooks to me, because bell hooks talks about teaching to transgress. How do we, and I think this is actually in alignment some, with some of the things that are happening in sound health, because we're, there's, there's a siloing that takes place across our professions, a siloing between different institutions, and there's also here a, a transgression of those lines. But it's this idea of like, how do we create research that transgresses what we have typically understood about research? Because clients are transgressing what we understand um, them to be in those contexts. Wow. Well. I think you know what you you got to so many different things. I mean, when you when you thought brought up the word assimilation, I thought so much of our work, whatever field we're in, I'm here in arts education. But if we're serving those who look like us, this idea of somehow distancing ourselves from it, if we're working with those who look like us, somehow we're not living up to our potential. That's a whole other conversation for another time. But it comes up not only within the education sphere; it comes up into the medical sphere. And this idea that the person who's coming to you for support and to work through what they need to work through has their own ideas about what success looks like. It's not just for us to put that on to the human. So I really appreciate that conversation about the own trauma that we're walking into ourselves. And even though I'm not a therapist, in my own work, again, it's deeply involved with supporting communities that look like myself um, and being able to, to be mindful of the role of, of music and arts as something that's a positive aspect of their lives. So I totally uh, align with that. Um, because we are running out of time, and this has been such a rich conversation, I wanted to ask you each if you would give um, your kind of a summary of what you think progress would look like in this sphere. So in your own words, um, I know that's a hard one, but what, do, what will progress look like to you in this field um, as a practitioner and as well as for our clients? Any order? I'll start. Um, since this didn't come up, um, what progress would look like for me, just one version of it, because there's a lot of progress that could be happening. I'm thinking about these amazing music therapy students in the audience, and I want to be able to assure them that they have job security and that they have financial wellness as a result of the incredible work that they do in the world. And as it stands right now, my personal experience is, um, not to sound like a victim, but I was kind of shoved into private practice um, in order to survive financially as a music therapist. And I think that needs to be said. And of course, I'm grateful that it happened because I've been able to build and discover, similar to what Mary Saul said, um, that I'm more than a music therapist. Um, and what I would also like to see happen is some of those classes and um, resources being brought into the music therapy education. Teach the students how to run their businesses, please. Teach them financial literacy. Teach them how to build a private practice, what it takes for entrepreneurial, I mean, California has billions of dollars right now, and I'm having to jump through hoops to fill out registrations to be able to access that money. That is for me as a black woman. You know, that's out there. So I would say please bring in resources and education and services to help um, young clinicians be able to navigate this terrain and to finally be able to break out of only being able to work in hospitals. Thank you. Yes, and so I'm going to say all of that plus. Um, I personally would really like to see more scholarships, not for music therapy students only, but for music therapy students of color. We already know that it is a white dominant field and a lot of the barriers to education and to the music therapy field being master's level entry is the financial burden. Um, so I would really like to see multiple tons of scholarships so that we can have more um, Music therapists of color. I think that would be a really great way to pave the way into all of these other things we talked about. I'd like to see a renovation of the way that we practice research. I, 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 can, I can only add, I can't improve, um, I can only probably lessen what you said because it was so magical and perfect and on point. But I'd like to see progress for me would look like a renovation, of the way that we engage in music and health research such that we no longer consider a randomized controlled trial a gold standard. That we examine different ways of knowing and emphasize qualitative exploration. That we ask people what's important to you so that we can study that that we open up our, our outcomes to include outcomes that matter to individuals, and some of them are positive, 
that we humanize, that we use the research to humanize the healthcare environment, the hospitals. That's why I, I speak from acute care and, and intensive care. And that we use music as a form of humanity and, uh, and that we acknowledge its social construct. And we use that to hand over the power that we have taken as clinicians. We have taken the power. Nobody came to me for therapy. They came to me because they had to because they needed a ventilator. And, and that we hand that power over by acknowledging people's identity and, that, and, we, and we amplify their identity through the use of music, amongst other things, but especially, which people can hear. We, we encourage the use in our research of cognitive stimulus that's meaningful for an individual. We give people lifelines to pull themselves out of coma, out of unconsciousness, out of loss of control, out of threats to identity. We measure these things because we have heard that they matter to people and that we use what means something to them. And in doing that, we gain health literacy of the individual, right? We hand over our power and we're now working together to accomplish whatever the goal is, even in the ICU even in the ICU, and that we preserve people's humanity and identity, and we do that in the research. And that means there's gonna be some too short playing in my ICU, because there was, and some EM40, and some music in languages I don't understand, and through with some structures that I don't understand musically, because I have no background for that, but that through that I gain more knowledge for my, the patients that I'm caring for. So that's what I, that, for me, that's progress, is to see the research move there and to see access open up in hospital settings and to see people get more comfortable with folks acting differently, making different facial expressions and surrounding themselves with different sounds. I guess I would say progress to me would be um, co creative collaborations and partnerships amongst those that are in this room <laughs> with many of the organizations that are represented here. And so, Selfish Pitch, I'm again founder of the Black Music Therapy Network. <laughs> and we are a service organization that focuses on the wellness and, and healing of black communities through music. But I also know, Maria Gracia, you're, you're also the founder of Latin Music Therapy Network. President, president. president, excuse me, of the Latin Music Therapy Network. We have many different um, organizations. Carlita, your organization also um, deserves funding and deserves attention. And I think that there is um, a significance in being able to put your money where your mouth is. And that's as simple as I can put it but also the creative collaborations that will come from that, will, that would transform the research, transforms the, the, the trajectories of what music therapy will be as well. So again, partnerships, collaborations around research, around services offered. Again, it's, I think about the BMT and the Black Music Therapy Network, it's not solely about um, feeding the practitioner. It's really about serving communities. And so I th there's, there's, and I, I speak of, us as an example of the many that exist. Right? So when I see an increase of those types of creative partnerships, then I know that we're moving to s somewhere because there's a decentralization of wh who and what may be important. And it's more so thinking about the communities that are important. There's a lot of ideas there. There are a lot of things that have been un unearthed or, or a lot of things that, are, that are, are just brimming to be discussed. But we often don't have the resources. We don't know the language of the NIH. We don't know different access points. And we're growing that knowledge, but without creative partnerships and without people being able to open doors for us as well, then there's an expectation to pull ourselves out by the bootstraps. And so again, just thinking about what that might look like will really transform the profession moving forward. Yes, and. Yes. I, that's exactly what I was going to speak about. Um, grant funding, that is progress to me. Um, grant funding for smaller nonprofits who are providing free resources to communities. Um, 
without grant funding, without accessibility to, to grants, uh, we are unable to provide these free resources and we just depend on our own bank account. Um, at this point, there are usually about eight to 10 very large nonprofits in the, in the black mental health world that receive the same funding over and over again. And it's the smaller nonprofits that don't receive the funding because we don't have the large budget line to make us eligible for these grants, um, or people are unaware of who we are. So it's so important, um, selfish plug, that people are aware of Darkness Rising Project and the free resources and the free therapy that we are offering so that we can receive more and more grant funding to be able to provide these free resources. Yes. <laughs> by, not and, by. Defunding the police, yes. defunding the war machine, yes. because all these things are connected, yes. defunding the carceral system, and really investing in infra the infrastructure of healing and wellness of people and the earth itself. Um, and so that would be a really easy way to fund all this stuff deeply. <laughs> wow. I just, I just want to thank you all for your wisdom, your humanity, and centralizing people first. That was evident in every single one of you as practitioners. So can we just give another warm round of applause to our <laughs> panelists? From my, from my you, left Jeanette. to my right. <laughs> Stacy, Maria Grazia, Rebecca. Uh, Marisol, Carlita, and Quetzal. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Of course, my Thanks privilege. For having us.